So, um, welcome to our presentation, Accessibility is Whole Team Responsibility. We are very proud to be again in Asheville and present at Drupal Camp about work which is done by North Carolina Department of IT. We have a small but very powerful team called Digital Solutions. And uh, me, um, Elena Talankar, uh, Digital Services Manager, and Marla Lopish, uh, Software Test Engineer. So we will um, tell a little bit about the work we have done for uh, our 85 state websites, which are using same code base, uh, Digital Commons platform, and uh, it's been work uh, for about 10 years. Uh, this um, platform is. Um, so we will talk about our story, how we are adding accessibility into different um, facets into our work. Uh, it is about content, it is about uh, testing before deployment, and also we will talk a little bit um, how accessibility approach changed this year. Um, could you raise your hands if you know about new DOJ rule and what is it about? Oh, wow. <laughs> so you're our audience because actually this year um, DOJ expanded the um, accessibility requirements. So instead of desired and uh, uh, useful item to have on your websites, it's now a requirement for state and local governments. And we have a little time to get ready before uh, actually uh, legal ramifications will come in. So let's look at what we have and how we need to work on that. And before we will talk um, about um, digital accessibility, I want to remind a kind of icebreaker or mood setting um, in 90s, when wheelchair ramp was created to help, uh, and it was added to ADA requirement, it was created to help people with mobile disabilities to get around. Since then, this ramp became so useful in many cases. When you are going through the big city with your luggage, when mothers are um, take, uh, pushing strollers, a lot of different uses. So people are accepting it, and all the work which was done became useful for everybody. So our approach, let's take digital accessibility and make it useful for everybody. So from this um, kind of lens, why now? Why DOJ just um, um, published this new rule? As we know, everything has moved to digital, especially after pandemic. Every government service is now mostly available only in digital format from website. So on April 24th, uh, the new federal rule was published and um, it, was, it updated regulations for digital accessibility for Title II of ADA, and it officially announced that WCAG version 2.1 um, level AA is official technical standard to go. So everything what you heard today at the several presentations which <coughs> mentioned accessibility, and all of them I think mentioned this standard, so this is now <laughs> official <laughs> Bible to build your sites and follow this technical standard. Um, so who is responsible according to this new G uh, DOJ ruling? Actually everyone, because this rule goes to all state and local governments, including small agencies, including libraries, including public schools. So this is a huge change in the way how um, people who are developing websites should consider accessibility. And it also, um, it's not only developers, people who are procuring this, because you need to make sure um, that everything what is linked from the website 
also follows the same rules. So it's procurement, it's maintenance of digital content. Everybody uh, get this new responsibility. So in a nutshell, the WCAG 2.1 requires, um, it's easy to remember and easy to understand and it follows uh, certain principles. Um, so content should be perceivable. So information should be available to digest different ways. So it means people who are using different technologies can get this information, can receive, can understand what is published on the website. It should be different modalities, so different, so it should be operatable. So small things like making sure your titles are clean and distinct, making sure you have descriptive links, simple things could actually go long way to help anyone using different devices to understand the information that are provided on the sites. It should be understandable, so it should be structured, uh, for, uh, for consistently formatted, and it should use images um, with alternative text, and it should use smart, it should use images in a smart way. And we all attended uh, Amy June presentation <laughs> just uh, before, where she explained very um, detailed um, what does it mean, effective use of images. And it should be robust. It should be that your website should be available on a variety of browsers. It should work, um, accessibility should be considered for a variety of media players because all visual content, just like the web page content should also work with assistive technology. So what is digital content? It's definitely our web pages and uh, we have, um, there's a lot of content there which needs to be available for different types of assistive technologies, but it also PDFs. And PDFs, as we all know, <laughs> who work in web, it's a huge problem. It's Word documents, it's all the videos, as I mentioned. So captions are a must now. We cannot just say that, oh, it will be edited by um, YouTube. No, you need to make sure that your video provides captions and transcripts, and the same goes um, for audio description. So all the um, applications um, which are linked from websites should follow the same rules. And we all know how important forms are for government. So uh, often forms are done um, in PDFs, but PDFs are not accessible. So making forms available for web, this is a huge new um, thing that is really taking off in government and I just learned this week that there is a new conference um, for about web form creation which was just stood up by Code for America. So where is North Carolina? Because we definitely represent North Carolina and we want to tell you our use case. So if you're working with any state or uh, state government entity in North Carolina, we recommend to look for North Carolina Accessibility and Usability Standard, which was published this year. Uh, our team helped uh, to create it and it uses WCAG 2.8 uh, compliance as a technical base for this standard. It gives you some really good ideas on how to create consistent visual design, how to optimize for search, what you need to consider for user-centered uh, design, um, making sure that your web application is responsive, 
It talks about forms and even requires the plain language to be um, considered and readability set up for eighth grade level. Why it's important? We people, so there is more than 10 million North Carolinians now using all these government services. They have different level of education and um, government likes jargon. And it's very, very bad. And sometimes you are reading the uh, page and you cannot understand it. So there are ways to present your content in more um, understandable and simple way using plain language, using structure and uh, better um, organization. So if you're interested, uh, the whole um, DOJ rule is about 300 pages. There are a couple of publications which really help to digest it and understand better because there are definitely are some requirements, different requirements for different level of government. So for example, North Carolina as a state has until April 24, 2026 to make sure that everything is compliant. Some, go ahead. I do, I'm sorry, I have a question. So the state agencies have less than two years, but what about all of the, the consultants that work with the state agencies that are linked up? Exactly. To sorry. So, yes, so in two years, this becomes a requirement for any state-operated website. Local governments have a variety of uh, time frames, I, depending on the size of the local government. But if you are working with any of the state agency entities, any department, two years is the cutoff uh, time before. And what is interesting, DOJ didn't um, explain any mecha mechanisms how they are going to enforce it. So they are just going to the same way as it's happening now for all federal agencies, they are just surveying and they are putting the lawsuits out there. So there is definitely a, a way to prevent all that. When you say state agencies, does that include like state universities? Yes. Wow. Yes, universities, community colleges, and everybody who are connected, yes. So it goes for everybody. I have a link in presentation which goes to the rule and it's digest so that really clearly states all, um, all the requirements. So because we support 85 different state agencies, we love to see happy faces on the, of our customers because we interact with all of them. And to do this, we found three ways how we support accessibility and how we um, help our customers get better. So of course, first thing is to make sure that the, our code base, the platform itself, is accessible. So this is number one. You need to make sure that your code satisfies all the uh, requirements. But there is also content that people create. And this is where huge liability for different approaches, how um, content becomes inaccessible. You can require um, alternative text for images, for example, very simple. It's part of the content, but um, it's a liability. And then uh, all the platforms are evolving, code is changing, uh, new bugs are introduced, new features are introduced, so regular testing. So these three items we consider the most important um, stages in our way to achieve accessibility compliance. So um, with the platform accessibility, this is, we got very lucky, and uh, a couple of years ago, state hired um, 
world level accessibility expert. And when I'm saying that, it's because our own accessibility guru have been uh, recently, uh, she received a web accessibility specialist certification for international association of accessibility professions, professionals, which is only 1,300 people in the world who have this uh, um, certification. So she made sure when she joined the platform, she made sure that our code, she reviewed all the code and she made sure that this, we are aiming to satisfy all the requirements. But as I mentioned, content. Content accessibility is never changing and never ending story. You train people, you explain, and then new people come. So you need to train again. <laughs> And you explain one thing, and then you find that somebody found a way around, and they are creating buttons which are completely inaccessible. So education piece. But over that, like how you help them, we really are trying to enforce um, website audits. And um, I will uh, talk a little bit more about how we do it. So website quality assurance and accessibility monitoring is considered a must for all our state websites. And we have two great tools that we use. First of all, all the websites utilize editorially on the back end. So when people are creating content in the text editor, editorially, which is a free tool created by Princeton University, Editorial automatically scans your um, content and shows what is inaccessible and how to improve it. And we utilize Mansida, that many of you probably are well aware, to really help uh, state agencies. And we have all, um, Mansida is available for all state websites. So we are building the awareness and really pushing people to use this tool to help them identify all the uh, items that need review. And the most complicated is training and community outreach because you talk about it, you show, but people forget, somebody doesn't pay attention, this is a very time consuming but very rewarding process. So uh, all these uh, links uh, here, so we created accessibility trainings. We add accessibility element into each level of training. We have 1300 content creators across the state. So we help them to understand it doesn't matter are they updating one page or they are building new site. So we really work with them on accessibility trainings. We publish blogs, we send out monthly newsletters, and all the web managers are welcome to join our sprint reviews. So there, when a new feature is introduced, all of them are part of this Fun Friday uh, showcasing um, so they can ask questions and better understand um, what is um, done there. And this year we started building state um, community of practice around accessibility to really um, involve more, pe more people and help them get to the level of education so by the time the OJ rule kicks in, we are really, we have this level of understanding what we are talking about. So they know the language, they know the terms, they know what does it mean and why. But our job never ends because developers are always, our platform is always evolving and new things get introduced. And this is where Marla shines because she is leading our accessibility testing features. Right. And here comes That was great. Let's see. Um, we naturally want to catch any errors, accessibility or otherwise, before we get out to production. Duh. 
and um, so we follow the shift left model. Um, we test our requirements. So during backlog grooming and sprint planning, and when a ticket's moved into the sprint, we include testing instructions before development even begins. So it's like sort of test-driven development. I like to pretend that it is. Uh, we test new code. Developers test the code on their local machines as they're developing. Um, and when it's successful, the code is merged into the development environment. And that's where the automated testing starts. Um, mostly regression testing, although I also do functional testing and, of course, the accessibility testing. And the tests are kicked off automatically through GitHub Actions on every deployment to the environment. So if I get hit by a bus or something, it still happens. And when the code reaches UAT, or as Duane says, UAT, Elena's team does manual exploratory testing, and I do semi-automated testing there. Uh, we smoke test on production, but rarely find any issues because all of the productions are identical. Um, so I do a little bit of functional testing on production because sometimes it behaves a little differently under load and our non-production sites might have like two people on them at a time, not really doing much of anything. Um, where I test, I think, is the most important thing. And this is um, how the, the automated testing works really well. I created a test suite that includes all the content types that we have available on the platform, all the paragraph types available on the platform, and their various options. Um, now, I say all, but it's not really all because, for instance, article cards have 26 different fields and options that you could do in combination. And I think I figured out the math once where Phoebe did for me, and it was like 100 million different options. So even for automated testing, that's insane. Not going to do that. But I cover at least the most likely scenarios. So um, these tests are deployed several times throughout the development sprint. And the regression testing obviously checks whether new development changed something un in an undesirable manner. Um, for example, if we increase the padding on a, I don't know, like a, like a CTA card, maybe it would affect a article card and it wasn't supposed to. So very quickly pick up things like that. Um, for all of the types of testing, we do automated, semi-automated, and manual because we found no one method of accessibility testing does it all, so we like to approach it in different ways. Obviously, you know, benefits of automated testing is the speed slash cost. We can cover so many more pages than a human being would really care to do. Um, so I have much greater test coverage using the automated tools. And because it's so consistent and replicable, it's accurate and the reporting also is really consistently presented, and that is nice to have an easy-to-read report. Um, so I do testing with a tool called Pope Tech, and it automatically finds accessibility issues on the websites that I tell it to check, which is mostly those t that suite of test pages. And it's scheduled to work with our development cadence, so it's deploying at appropriate times throughout a sprint. Uh, it flags area and structural errors, provides a record of the issue so it's not just all up in here, and it's integrated with JIRA so I can create tickets from issues that I find and send all the information right to our developers. And the um, screenshot here is just showing what the high level of a report looks like. It's saying, you know, there's broken area references, there's very little contrast, missing alt text, Etc. Um, and it will pick up content errors, like I consider alt text more of a content error. I'm looking more at the structural features like the area references or mm, whether fields are labeled correctly. So this is what the report looks like. In that top screen, it's giving a description of something that it found. Um, it it's gives a suggested solution. It's got a link to documentation about it. Um, and then you'll see it shows you exactly where in the code the problem is. 
And again, I can include all of that in a JIRA ticket so our developers have all the information right at their, their fingertips. And the tool is also configurable, which is nice. So I can adjust it to disregard certain things because I actually have deliberate accessibility errors in some of my test pages, and I don't want it to keep flagging that. It's deliberate, I know it's there, stop telling me about it. So it's nice to be able to exclude that from the report if I care to. Uh, we've done really well with Pope Tech. It has found a few errors for us that we've corrected. Um, so I, I'm, we've been very pleased with it. And again, the value of it is it can run all of my test pages at once. Doesn't need me to kick off each one of them individually, which uh, when you see my other slides, maybe you'll know <laughs> it's so important. <laughs> So semi-automated testing we also do um, throughout the life cycle. And what's great about it is you can do quick testing of a single page. Like you just did this one thing, just want to check this little thing. I don't need to set up a test. I don't need to code anything. I don't need to kick it off, so to speak. So it's a good complement to automated testing. And there's a lot of tools, there's, or there's a lot of free tools for this kind of evaluation. Like the first one is the Web AIM website. You can plunk in your web page address and it will go and generate a report for you. Um, but just like any, any kind of testing, you really need human evaluation to look at those results and decide whether they are in fact real errors and really important. So, um, I typically will use the Wave browser extension because I can use it on my local and dev environments and for password protected pages, So, um, which you can't do when you're plugging in your, your URL to the, the website. So I will sometimes do this on my local, as I said, and I can also, if I'm investigating an issue, I can make changes on my local. I can make changes to the code, run the test again and see, did I fix it or not? <laughs> Um, so one of the issues with any kind of testing is false positives. So on this, for instance, Wave was telling me that there's a contrast issue related to the search box. I couldn't even find it. But when I, when I turned the styles off on the page, <coughs> then, I could, then I could see where it was. So that gave me kind of a clue where to be looking. And is it a false positive or is it not? Because when I inspect the page, I don't know if you guys can see this, the offending element is visually hidden. And if it was visible, the contrast would be unacceptable. But a user, whether using assistive technology or not, will never encounter that. They will never encounter that piece of code. So it's not really an issue. But this is something we will address and fix because the accessibility checker is flagging it. And I know to disregard it, but not everyone else does. And so some of you may have also experienced a situation we have where a well-meaning but not well-informed journalist, say, runs a scan on our websites and publishes an article saying, oh, accessibility errors. <laughs> and it's really awkward to explain to the public and also to our management that this is not really an error. It's visually hidden. It's not going to happen. We don't want that. We just want to prevent that problem entirely. And I think it's probably just a better, cleaner way to, to do your code anyway. Just head off those kind of problems to start with. If anyone's interested in why it was visually hidden, we can come back to that. Um, I also do testing with the Axe DevTools browser extension. This report style is so much easier to look at, in my opinion. I mean, this, this to me is, is like hard to look at. So um, DevTools gives you this very neat report and if you can click on the issue, all page content should be contained by landmarks and just like the others, it will give me more information. Um, this is another sort of false positive, again, because it's not something a user will ever actually encounter even with assistive technology. So it's flagging the landing page main image as not being contained in landmarks, such as header or section, main, whatever. And it's not, it's not within landmarks. But the main image is a background image. 
It's a decorative and the user doesn't interact with it. So someone using a screen reader will be unaware of its existence even. Um, so it's not important functionally to have it within the landmarks for navigation, but once again, we'll address it because the tool is finding it and it would be embarrassing if someone says your page is inaccessible because you're not within landmarks. Uh, and so our brilliant uh, senior UX developer, Amy Hepler, is cleaning up some of these little loose ends like that. But not everything is false positives. All of the tools have found a number of legit accessibility errors that we fixed. And so they're well worth using. And again, because we're, we're deploying these continuously throughout our development cycle, because developers will develop and they make new features and they change stuff. And so these tests will run automatically and flag if there's an issue right away. Um, but I will also say, and this is similar to what um, Amy June is saying, that no one method is going to catch everything. And so one of the reasons we use these different approaches is to get the different perspectives. So, for instance, manual testing really pulls it all together. Uh, we saw results from automated testing have to be evaluated by experts. <coughs> They didn't, you might have noticed too, they didn't both catch the same error. One did a contrast, one did a landmark thing, right? So it can take a lot of digging to determine whether an issue is real or not. It has to be evaluated by an expert. Um, and also manual testing by people who actually use assistive technology finds issues that are unfindable by tools. So when we were developing this version of the the platform, what we called the portal theme, we were able to hire a local company called Abler who provided testers who use the actual assistive technologies. So uh, the next time we do another improvement like that, we'll try to hire them again and get their expertise. I've been trying to learn how to use a screen reader. It's so hard, <laughs> but I'd like to have that that ability myself to do the kind of like personal manual testing. Um, and then of course, Elena's team are expert acceptance and usability testers, and those points are both important too. Usability is also as important as accessibility, and they've helped make continuous improvements to the platform. So all of the testing is important. Oh, and yes, this is us finding an error. We are so happy. Um, so you might want to try out some of the free tools yourself. Use it on your own website. Uh, there's what the WebAIM website, but you can also get the browser extensions for Chrome, Firefox, whatever you're using. And if you want to, you can try it on this um, sort of demo page that I have on the Digital Commons site that has all kinds of errors on it. Uh, it's digitalcommons.nc.gov slash Igor who is my pet, and unfortunately there will only be content type errors. The developers won't let me introduce structural accessibility errors on the live <coughs> platform. Go figure. But um, anyone who wants to give that a try, help yourselves. So to conclude that for the best coverage, use a variety of tools and methods, approach it any, as many ways as you can. Uh, build an automated testing program for volume and frequency of testing. And of course, have that test suite because it can only test what you tell it to test. So we want to have a very extensive list of what it should test. And whenever possible, enlist the help of people who use assistive technologies day to day. Um, that was about where my presentation ended, but there was one other thing I kind of wanted to add that um, I started, we, we provide website visitors a very good accessible experience and we're constantly trying to improve it. But one thing I found is that when I went in as a logged in user, as a content creator, the Claro theme that we use is not accessible at all. There's many issues with it. And I would like for us, when I say us, I mean Amy Hepler, the UX developer, I would like for us to consider someday um, contributing to Drupal by maybe making that theme accessible, cleaning up those area labels and such. 
I don't know much about contributing to Drupal. I haven't done it before, but I will say, like, if anyone, if that rings a bell to anyone, you feel like you're interested in it, shoot me an email, and I can at least facilitate getting it going, even if ultimately I'm not the expert in accessibility. But that seems to me like a worthy project because when you figure that, oh, I wish Amy was here to say this, something like 30% of human beings have a certain, some, some sort of need for assistive technology or some sort of disability. That's 30% of our content creators, our website managers, our publishers, not just the website visitors. So I would like it if we were providing an accessible experience for, for those users as well. It would make us probably rich and famous, <laughs> by which I mean Amy would be rich and famous. <laughs> All right, um, that's it for me. Elena, do you, do you have any questions? Have you question. hit the back. I, hi, thank you, Phoebe Simon. Um, quick question, because I know that the things that startle me about all of this is that in 2026, the DOJ is going to start scanning not just government, but anybody who contracts with the government, any college, any library, blah, 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 blah. So it's terrifying how many people don't know about this ruling. The other mm -hmm. thing that I think is terrifying is that you pointed out how some two different tools found two different errors. Yeah. Couple that with the fact that the DOJ has not yet divulged what they're going to use to scan these sites. Good point. <laughs> it's just, it's the perfect storm. Yeah. Right? And it's I, like we're just shooting in the dark. We're throwing exactly. rocks at things and not knowing what we're, where we're trying to land. Exactly. That kind of leads into a question I had. You, you, you were talking about how to curate a list of, of endpoints to pass through your testing suite. And like, what, what's the government going to do? Crawl every single website? Like, do you use a do you use a crawler to, to generate that list? How do you this is an Elena list? question, I think. Well, like uh, Monsito. Mm -hmm. Monsito. Monsito. We use Monsita, which really flags everything, even more than needed. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> this is why we have. We're using Monsita for quality assurance, for to find broken links to. The, it's a very powerful suit. It's the sa they get the same public facing information as Google, so they they see your site, but they have this great underlying layer identifying different levels of accessibility. Valid bugs as well as make sure you're looking because mm -hmm. this could easily be flagged as a as a content key. So. The great thing about Monsito is you can see very specific bugs where that government agency is not meeting accessibility requirements along with, hey, you added a video here, make sure that you've got you know, closed captioning on or whatever it is. So it, it, it's, it's a good balance. Yeah, mm -hmm. one, challenge, one challenge for us is that nothing in our platform is accessible by anonymous users. So like a, a Google or some of those scanners isn't going to pick up anything. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's a role-based access system. So one per, unless you're going in as user one, you're not going to see absolutely everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. There. So that, that's another challenge. Mm -hmm. right? How do you yeah. do it chunk by chunk by chunk? That's true. And as far as the yeah. back end, you know, we have different levels of users, so they don't all see exactly the same thing. So again, that's why I would really like to see the, the uh, admin theme more accessible. Do you know what the process is so when a site does get flagged after the date for an issue? Um, I know I know the process for federal sites right now is that basically you have a certain amount of time to remediate that before it becomes a problem. Do you know if the similar process can be applied to the state and municipal government sites as well? Probably. Um, as I said, they didn't announce how they are going to enforce it. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you mentioned yeah. that process, at yeah. least you're notified and you have a chance to remediate it before that yes. is a problem. And then, yeah, they say, oh, when you're signed in as X type of user, this happens and you can yeah, yeah. go into the user and find it. So you don't have to necessarily find everything through all your scenarios. At least you have the chance to remediate it before you get you know, lost in your and, so. and I, Yeah, and I think they would give us a chance to, to remediate before they threw us in jail. 
I'm going to uh, But <laughs> one, thing, one thing I wanted to clarify is that um, when I'm talking about like the, the testing that I do, the automated testing, the structural testing, the tests we, our platform is the same architecture all across 85 websites. So none of those other agencies can create anything outside of what I can create. So I'm always tweaking and adding to that test suite, but it's going to cover anything that they can do as well. So testing on other sites would be redundant really um, for content, yes, but not so much for the structure. It's the same across all, all the websites. But I do occasionally discover novel approaches <laughs> that users have taken, and that will sometimes well, either like uh-uh, <laughs> that's out, or or it turns into it tur or it turns into a feature request. Like, if they're going to do this, let's help them do it properly. And so that's the kind of thing that'll get added to the, the test suite. But I would also like to kind of build on what you were saying about how federal right now um, allows some time to to fix the errors and comply for the site. We consider it our um, obligation to provide North Carolinians with accessible websites. So this is why this team is really working hard to educate themselves and to make sure that the websites that um, everybody in the state are using, that they are accessible for people because this is government information and we shouldn't exclude anyone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from Yeah, we have much more of a, a mandate even than, yeah. than I'm trying to think of an example. I don't know. <laughs> what was the pizza chain that got sued for a lot of money for inaccessibility? I want to say it was like Papa John's. Don, Papa John's? I think it was Papa John's. Papa John's. Yeah, yeah. But I think you got, I think even if you get flagged, you have a remediation yes. period, an abatement period. Yep. <laughs> you know, if you just go off and decide you don't want to do it, then, then they start breaking yeah. the hammer. Yeah. Down, but. Yeah, and we have to we have to look at to. I mean, clearly, I am not a lawyer, but um, there's the platform that we are responsible for, but the content all these different agencies are responsible for. Um, so they might get sued, and we wouldn't, or vice versa. <laughs> but we are trying to educate them and help them to understand how they can create accessible content and mm -hmm. how much easy it is. If you think about it, if you keep it in mind, it becomes part of your routine. And, mm -hmm. and we, we do try to develop so that people can't make accessibility errors, but obviously we can't prevent them from doing everything. They can incorrectly apply a heading style, right? We can't stop them from doing that. But at least Monsito can pick it up and we can scold them. It's my job. <laughs> I will stop recording. I, I th yeah, I think we're over our time. <laughs> <laughs>